Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Great. All right. Uh, so first off, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm really enjoying this. Um, and then uh, it's kind of nice to be back in Brazil. My first conference talk ever was in Maranhão, so about 10 years ago. So it's nice to be back here. Um, my talk is a little different from all the other talks because it's mirror symmetry and then also a nerdy part about mirror symmetry of Landau Ginsberg models. Uh, so I'm going to try to introduce both parts, both nouns in my uh, title, and then kind of explain their uh, combination, their end. Um, so I'm going to start with a little crash course into mirror symmetry, uh, and uh, then Landau Ginsberg models, which is a fancy word for something very concrete that we often see in, in algebraic geometry, and then uh, kind of generalizing what we would see in algebraic varieties for Landau Ginsberg models. All right. And I'm going to mainly focus on enumerative geometry uh, and then some cohomological uh, versions of mirror symmetry. And I'm going to kind of avoid kind of a categorical story as I go. Uh, this uh, is work with, uh, this is joint work with Mark Gross and Ron Tesler. Okay, so first off, what is mirror symmetry, right? Mirror symmetry is a way to link symplectic geometry or enumerative geometry with algebraic geometry. Originally, it came from a duality in string theory, uh, which had two different models of string theory, 2A and 2B, and their superconformal theories were equivalent, but with different inputs. So then what you got was an exchange where the symplectic invariants of a symplectic manifold uh, are encoded in an algebraic invariance of another space, which we now call the mirror. So originally, this was established for Calabial threefolds, because you have six extra dimensions in string theory, but it was later generalized to all collab to Calabial varieties and further to Fano manifolds and beyond, as you'll see in Landau Ginsberg world. Okay, uh, and there's many flavors, um, but I'm going to start by telling you the traditional 1991 story of the quintic threefold, and then uh, move to kind of my favorite objects, and I'll try to tell you why looking at Landau Ginsberg models is fairly natural. Okay. So the quintic threefold was the first place where we saw uh, some evidence of mirror symmetry existing. Okay. So if I take a hypersurface of degree five inside P4, that's the quintic threefold, and um, we, it, it's a wonderful hypersurface and projective variety, and we are able to understand a little bit about its mirror symmetry. And what we found in, I think, 1989, Green and Plesser said the mirror should be this hypersurface in this toric variety. So you take P4 and you quotient it by a group of order 200, or 125 uh, that's acting on P4 by just taking this group. So you kind of glue all those points together and then you're gonna get a singular variety and when you take the minimal resolution of it, you get a Calabial back. Okay, and what one found is that uh, the original paper just wrote this as uh, this X in this X psi check uh, that I have here. Um, they had opposite Euler characteristic, okay? And a priori, that was already very interesting. At that point, we didn't know that a lot of Calabi L3 folds had positive Euler characteristic. A lot of them were shown to be negative, but you know this predicted that uh, this mirror symmetry prediction, this duality in Calabian moduli space, as they called it, um, gave that they should come in even hands. Right? You should have as many negative Euler characteristics as positive Euler characteristics. And this was later defined. Oh, what did I do? Okay, I'm messing up. Ah, no, I'm going the wrong way. Great. Okay, perfect. I accidentally hit the wrong button. All right. But uh, the kind of refinement was that it was this, that there was a isomorphism, isomorphisms of vector spaces on the level of Hodge numbers. Okay. So that was the first kind of establishment on some type of cohomological level of mirror symmetry. But then it was later generalized to kind of, or very quickly generalized to enumerative geometry. So, uh, oh, yeah. Why do I keep on going the wrong way? Okay. Perfect. Okay. So. The first thing is that um, one thing that we're really interested in algebraic geometry is counting how many curves are in a given object, right? 
So first off, you know, back, uh, you can take the quintic threefold and ask how many rational degree D curves are inside it, okay? So this goes, this dates back to Schubert, showing that there's 2,875 in a general quintic. And then the next time that we got another degree was in the 80s when Katz, or Sheldon Katz proved that there's, I think it's like 600 something, or 1,000 uh, conics inside the quintic. And Clemens then conjectured in the 80s that this number should be finite uh, for a very general quintic threefold. But quite quickly, um, in the 90s, Candela de la Asa and Green Parks was able to uh, give a prediction using mirror symmetry that there should be, uh, that you can read this off through a generating function given by looking at the mirror. So this is a Calabial variety. It has a unique up to scaling uh, holomorphic uh, top degree or top dimension form. And you can integrate with respect to that when you look at a degeneration. So we degenerate with respect to psi, and then you end up with this being the, um, the expansion of this when you expand with respect to psi. Um, and then you end up with a generating function that will predict and let you read off the number of degree D rational curves on the very general quintic threefold. So in particular, periods in Hodge theory is encoding all this enumerative information of the mirror which is a very beautiful thing. And this was then proven by Lian Lu and Yao, uh, as well as Givental in 96. So quite quickly after this kind of insight, we are able to deduce what enumerative information should exist. I say we, not me, but um, yeah, okay. All right, so the questions that linger in this is there's a lot of like magic going on, right? Because you look at this and you say, how did they do that? How, what kind of intuition did they have? How did they construct this mirror? I mean, this looks very synthetic, right? You know, if you look at the green pluser paper, what they did is they just computed all of the quotients that are possible of like a symmetric calabial or quintic threefold, and then they found one that matched, right? So how did they choose what the mirror should be? And then also, how do you find the right deformation in order to get this kind of generating function? Those are some two foundational questions that you know you want to find out in full generality, okay? And my goal today is to try to give you insight on these two answers for lambda Ginsburg models. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at just uh, a very general quintic threefold. I'm not looking at a specific one right here. Yeah, you think of the deformation space because you want to view this as a symplectic object, and by Moser's theorem, they're all symplectomorphic. But does this look more like an individual or are you trying to represent the uh, Yes, yeah, it's a one dimensional, yeah, so you have that H1 of the tangent bundle is one. So there's no one to one uh, So there's, um, so one finds that the kind of space of Kähler forms for this is one dimensional, and then the space of, yeah, yeah. So you have to always think that one of them is symplectic and one of them is algebraic, and then like the amount of deformations has to be the same. Great question, thanks. A is considered symplectic. Yeah, this is what we call gromov witten theory that is given for the symplectic. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, all right. So. Now uh, that I'm gonna say that I'm gonna answer these for a Lando Ginsburg models, I should tell you what a Lando Ginsburg model is, okay? So a Lando Ginsburg model is a triplet of data where I take a quasi-affine variety, X, a group, and I'm gonna just choose finite groups today. You can choose reductive groups if you feel like that, and you can do whatever you want, uh, it's nice. And then just a regular G invariant function uh, to C from X. So the first example that you have is I'm gonna take complex numbers, or A1, then x to the r is a perfectly good regular function, right? And then I'm just going to take roots of unity acting on that. So that's the, that's the first example of a Landau Ginsberg model that you can possibly have. Or maybe, you know, just taking the group to be trivial. Those are both perfectly good Landau Ginsberg models. And I'm going to mainly focus on doing those examples explicitly today, right? Um, now, 
now that we've described what a lando Ginsberg model is, maybe I should tell you um, why these are natural. So firstly, um, I, I mentioned before that we've expanded mirror symmetry past collabial varieties. When we had to expand to say Fano manifolds like P2 and understand mirror symmetry for P2, its mirror is not naturally a collabial anymore. It turns out to be a lando Ginsberg model. So lando Ginsberg models naturally showed up in mirror symmetry as uh, mirrors, but also they show up as deformations of complete intersections inside toric varieties. So first off, I'd like to maybe give you an example of how it shows up as a symplectic deformation, because that doesn't feel quite natural. So the way that we kind of view this is I'm going to just do an example where I'm going to take, um, say, ZF inside P4, where this is just going to be a quintic polynomial. So this is inside uh, the sections of P4, uh, o of 5, so this is a degree D, or degree 5 polynomial. Well, I can make a global function on algebraic variety using this section. And the way that I do this is I take the total space of O of minus 5, so I take the dual vector bundle, and then I can just pair with the section F, and that will give me um, a map to A1, or C, right? So this also can be rewritten as, uh, you know, if I, if I make the bundle coordinate U, then I can rewrite this as, say, UF, U times F, right? And this is on P4, but there's another way to write this total space. I can write it as a quotient. So I can write it as uh, C5 minus the origin, and then I'm going to quotient by a C star, but I need the bundle still. So I take C, and then I can quotient by a C star. Right? So that's the same thing as here. And then uh, when I look at this quotient, uh, this is acting by weights, say, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, minus 5. But this is kind of a choice of a quotient here. So here I chose to get rid of this bad orbit, but there's still a bad orbit on this C. So there's actually a choice of how I did this geometric quotient, given by geometric invariant theory. So the other choice of it that I could do is I could just choose C5 uh, mod, uh, cross C star mod C star. And this is equivalent are isomorphic to think of C5 mod Z mod Z5. Okay. So what you can find is that there, this kind of function on here is equivalent to a Z mod 5 invariant function on C5. So you end up with a Lando Ginsberg model here, C5 uh, Z5 F, that's a deformation of this story here. Any questions about that? So in, in particular, you can recover this z of f as, as long as f is smooth, as the singular locus up here. So the landau ginsberg model is kind of telling you what the singularity theory of this kind of thing is, of f is. Okay. But one of the main reasons I like them is I just find them neat. Uh, they're interesting in their own right. But they give you kind of a global uh, perspective of mirror symmetry, as we call it. All right. So the questions now kind of specified towards lando ginsberg models that I want to answer today are uh, how do we construct a mirror for an LG model, and how do we concoct the right deformation, just like we did for the quintic threefold mirror? <laughs> so the first example of mirror symmetry between LG models is given by these two pairs. So you have this kind of Fermat version of the one-dimensional example that we are looking at uh, that is some deformation of some big quotient in a weighted projective space, and then uh, just the function, the Fermat polynomial. Okay. And a priori, the, this mirror was written, uh, built uh, combinatorially. 
And this is good as a first um, approximation, but uh, the annoyance is that it's not a geometric way to interpret this. All right. So we would like to be able to construct mirrors using geometric information if we're going to learn ge something geometric, right? So that's the, the first thing that we want to try to do, and uh, kind of the state of the art in mirror symmetry is to try to build uh, not from just kind of the details of it, but from just only the geometry intrinsically, okay? If we want to have a general story, we should try to use the, ge the geometry rather than the auxiliary data. Uh, so here, what we end up with is the period integrals, or the, what, what I'll use as oscillatory integrals associated to the Fermat polynomial here, um, encapsulate a numerative invariant of, the, of this LG model, uh, but you have to make a deformation of this thing, much like this kind of one parameter deformation of the Fermat in the mirror story, um, and that ends up being something called flat coordinates. And this has been done uh, kind of perturbatively, so if you want to know an invariant, you can do it term by term until you get to the invariant. But it's not done like on the nose, so it's important to kind of figure out how to just figure out what all of it is instead of just doing it perturbatively. So these are the two annoyances I want to get rid of here. Okay. So that's kind of my story about mirror symmetry and Linda Ginsburg models, but now I'm going to go to part three of my talk where I'm going to talk about what the analog to periods in Hodge theory are for Linda Ginsburg models. Do I have any questions? What time did I start? 11, okay, great, thanks. All right, so, you know, first off, I have this function, and you know, when I think about Hodge theory and periods, that I, I usually think about a space, but I have to think about a function here, right? So I have to twist something in a way that allows me to actually make a cohomology theory. So the way I do this is I take the Duram complex and I'm going to twist it with um, the function. So I'm going to mainly do this just for the f example um, x to the r. Because let's just start there, right? It's already complicated enough, right? But it, it, it's really a beautiful computation. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a variable h bar. This is just going to be a formal variable. And then I'm going to look at the following twisted Duram complex. So what I originally, what I have is I have the Duram comp differential. And then I'm going to add a twisting by uh, dw, okay? So here it's going to be my w. And then... Is this what I'm on? Uh, yeah, and then I'm going to look at this hypercohomology of this complex, okay? But I'm really fortunate in this example because um, all of the cotangent bundles here are globally generated, so I can really just do this on, the, on forms, okay? So I'm going to do this example quite on, on the board where uh, just in dimension one, right? So first off, I end up with a following complex. So I have the structure C on C, and then I have one forms on C going to zero, and um, this is just the twisted Duram differential, h bar, dw wedge, okay? So this is just generated by, you know, functions on C, it's just polynomials, right? So let's just do each monomial one by one, All right? So if I look at, say, one, let's just do a warm up. Well, the Duram differential on one is zero, uh, but then I need to compute dw. So dw is just uh, r x to the r minus one dx, right? I just differentiate this and add the one form. So what this is gonna go to is just r x to the r minus one dx, okay? And I'm trying to look at the cohomology at this point. You know, I, I, so I just need to know what the image is here and I'm gonna quotient it by all of the functions here. Now, if I do, say, uh, x to the i uh, plus 1, what does this go to? This goes to i x to the i, or sorry, i plus 1. That's how calculus works. Uh, <laughs> so um, x to the i dx, and then I have to take this twisted Duram differential. So I end up with a r uh, h bar inverse 
x to the r plus i uh, dx, right? So what do I, what, what's left, what's the co-kernel? So, so um, I know that anything of x to the r minus one is going to vanish. And then if something's higher than x to the r minus one, then I can lower it and put it at something r lower, right? So in particular, I get a basis. So the first degree hypercohomology has a basis just given by dx, x dx, up to x to the r minus two dx. Okay. Happy? Okay. So that's this computation. So we get a basis for the hypercohomology group. This is your cohomology that you would give uh, a Landau Ginsberg model. Okay. So this is fun, right? So um, <laughs> I think it's fun. Yeah. So you can actually generalize this for any Fermat polynomial. So uh, you just get that it just kind of works the same way. You just do the straightforward computation. It's a good exercise. If you get stuck, you can check this preprint. Um, and, and you can compare it to the Jacobian ring, right? It's, it's just the same thing, right? Uh, the Jacobian ring is if I just took this, right? But then I, but, but I've twisted it. And there's a reason I twisted it. You'll see it in just a second, okay? So, uh, oh, I wanna skip that. I don't have time. Okay, so, uh, well, maybe, I don't know, this would be good for everyone to see. Okay, so, um, so the mirror I said was um, C mu r x to the r, right? But now I have a finite group here. So when I have a finite group, I just take a direct sum over all of the finite groups, and then I take G invariance. And then I look at everything with a fixed locus, okay? So if I looked at this one, I'm gonna have something where, you know, this is going from I equals zero to R of this kind of thing, but I'll just denote it by this, just to, or with the complex that's given to G. And when it's zero, I just get the same thing back, right? Because the fixed locus is the same, but I'm taking G invariance. And none of these are invariant with respect to the mu R action because all of them will have a non-trivial root of unity. This will have like a zeta in front of it, so it's gonna van it's not invariant, up to a zeta to the r minus one, so it doesn't vanish. So what I end up with is just, uh, this is equal to r, uh, oh, it's r minus one, right, um, of these things. But the fixed locus it, of this is just the origin. So I just get the zeroth cohomology, so I just get r minus one, I get, yeah, I just get r minus two um, pieces, okay? So then the dimensions of the cohomologies of these things match. So that's like a cohomological test of mirror symmetry here, okay? So this is kind of a really nice way to see that the, the matching of these two mirrors actually happens on some type of topological level. All right, now back to our scheduled programming. Okay, so there's a dual for this hypercohomology, okay? And it's given by these relative homology cycles where I take something where the real part of W over H bar is uh, getting really, really close to minus infinity. And the reason I do that is because I wanna integrate, right? So I wanna actually integrate over such a cycle and I want it to go off to infinity but I want it to just converge. So that's the reason I do that. And when I do that, I actually get a perfect pairing between this hypercohomology and the relative homology. So this is a way for me to actually start integrating and getting periods. And the nice thing about this is, why did I choose this twisted Duram differential? It's just because I want integration parts by parts to work. Okay, so you can check that, you know, if you do integration by parts on this integral, yeah, I need to do this instead of just take the standard. Okay. And since it's a perfect pairing, I can write down a dual basis to any kind of piece of my basis that I have right here. So what I'll end up with is, um, you know, some psi uh, zero up to like psi r minus two, so that the integral of e to the x to the r over h bar x to the i over psi j is dx is equal to just the Kronecker delta function. Okay. So once I do that, 
I have to, I, I have these nice integrals that I'm going to integrate over. Now I have to deform, okay? So I'm going to take all the deformations because I have, uh, so I'm going to take a versal deformation as a first approximation that won't work, but we'll try it anyway, okay? And then I'm going to integrate with the versal deformation up here with just x to the i over all of the cycles. When I do that, I'm going to get some uh, power series in the terms of the h bars where the coefficients are power series in these uh, deformation parameters. Okay? When I do this, I can compute it um, by just taking off the versal deformation part and just exponentiating it using the power series. And I'm going to get some kind of combinatorial um, monster that we want to tame. And what we do is we just use the dual basis and integrate by parts. So let's do an example. Uh, oh yeah, so this is the goal. What kind of deformation we want? We want something that looks like this. We want it to be all of the positive powers of h bar to go away. We want just one constant, and then we want them to be linear in the h bar inverse term. So this gives you some type of integrability um, that uh, is called Saito's primitive form. And um, the, the, this deformation will be called flat coordinates of my uh, original potential. Okay. So the hard thing is finding this. So, but when you find it, it's going to tell you all of the enumerative invariants of its mirror. And they're all going to sit in just the h bar to the minus 2 term. All of the, if, if you're a enumerative geometer, what's going to happen is after the h bar minus 2 term, all of the descendant theory is going to be past that. All right, problem, this is hard to write down, this deformation. So let's look at the first non-trivial example. If I take just the versal deformation of x to the 4, let's try to compute what all these, what all these integrals are. Okay. So I'm going to just take this deformation, and this, this omega, you should just think it's just a dx here. Okay. I, I changed it here, but it's just a dx. All right. And I'm just going to choose psi 0 just to make our lives concrete. Okay. So we know that psi zero has this property. That's one of the useful things, but we're going to need a little bit more. So I just exponentiate, okay, and then I start expanding. So if I expand, this is what the first few terms look like, okay? I just take the, this is the k equals zero, then this is the k equals one, and then this is the k equals two, and so on and so forth, right? And when I do this, I get that this part just survives because I use this, this function, right? Or the, the, and then this s to x squared vanishes because of this pairing, right? Because I have an x squared, and the x squared will pair with the psi 0 to be 0. Same for this one. And then this one survives because I have an x to the 0, right? However, when I get to this s2 squared, x to the 4, well, x to the 4 is not inside the, 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 the dual basis, right? So I have to use something different. So what I use is integration by parts, and it lowers the, uh, the, the degree of the polynomial, and it gives me an h bar. Okay? So this h bar is how I start getting things that are complicated, okay? because when I integrate by parts, I'm going to get a new factor of an h bar, and these higher orders are going to start canceling with these h bars in the denominator here. So I'll get some h bar inverse here. And then I'll keep on going. The, these will the x cubes uh, go away because uh, of integration by parts. That's that's just this lovely thing. And um, I just kind of keep on reducing term by term. Okay. And when you do this, for all of them, you end up something that looks like this. So you're almost linear. The problem is this this term. So I just reparametrize this lack of linearity. So I just make t zero equal to this and then t1 equal to the s1, and so on and so forth. And then I just get this kind of flat coordinates here. So this is what x to the 4 looks like. It's fairly, it's just one correction from the versal deformation. Now, this becomes unwieldy when I'm not at r equals 4, right? So when you look at x to the 10, it already starts getting bad. <laughs> Your face is very sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you know what we have to do is we have to uh, we we try to find these flat coordinates, but um, and, and there was like 
papers in the integrable systems uh, literature in the 80s by Nomi and Yamada um, trying to understand this. Uh, but uh, fortunately, mirror symmetry kind of comes to save the day. Right? So the first theorem I want to give at my talk uh, is that this is a closed form expression of the flat coordinates for x to the r. So we're able to give this uh, deformation where we can just hand you some kind of factorial over a power uh, for certain conditions. And then this gives you the unique, um, the unique flat coordinates for x to the r as a sum. Okay. And um, this, so, uh, I'm giving you spoilers. Okay, so, um, so uh, yeah, so you can just write this down, but the, the key thing is you, you get this number, which you, so the way the proof for this goes, um, so the previous proofs were kind of integrable system -y. Uh Ours is just completely combinatorial using this on, on sides. So we're able to use mirror symmetry to just guess on the dot what the mirror is by just saying this coefficient should be an open enumerative invariant for the mirror. So in particular, the deformed potential can be viewed as a generating function of open enumerative invariance of the mirror. And this is a geometrically intrinsic way to actually construct the original mirror of your symplectic manifold. Right? So before, in the kind of Fano manifold case, this was seen by, say, Fukaya, O, Oda, and Ono, or Cho and O, or Mark Gross, uh, and Gross-Siebert, by thinking of these like Maslow index two disks or um, our tropical disks, but here we have to build a whole new open enumerative theory for, an, for a Landau-Ginsberg model, okay? But fortunately for the R-spin version, this was done by uh, Sasha Buryak, Emily Clater, and Ron Tesler. So we're able to kind of uh, use that kind of point of view in order to answer the two questions that we had today uh, of how do we construct such a mirror for an LG model geometrically, and how do we find the right deformation? Well, we use open enumerative invariance, okay? So, uh, and that answers both of these questions in kind of a imprecise sense where I kind of have black boxed all the enumerative invariance, okay? So the, f the question you might have in the next 10 minutes is what are these enumerative invariants, right? So we take a deep breath and we're gonna go through. Okay, so, all right, so I'm going to take a moduli space of curves. Right? And I'm going to give it a lot of decoration. So I'm going to take a moduli space. You can first take, say, M0 and bar. So I have some stable rational curve with marked points, P1 through Pn. And then I'm going to put on top of it a line bundle. So I have some line bundle and then a map such that I, the map gives me an rth tensor power of the line bundle to the log canonical bundle. Okay. And locally at each of these points, I'm gonna think of them as an orbifold point. So they're gonna locally look just like C mod mu r. But that's fine and well, and that's well-defined for this, but the second that I put this bundle on here, it, locally at each of these points, I have to specify some structure. So I end up with this kind of uh, question here of locally at each point, I have to choose some monodromy mi that's happening in the bundle, okay? And funnily enough, this is exactly what these kind of points will correspond to, you know, these group elements. So, what I can then do is I'll just, for notation, I'll twist this to kind of explain that it's the discrepancy between these two. And then I can make a moduli space of R spin curves with fixed internal twi twists, so the alpha i's will parametrize what all these twists are, okay? And this is a perfectly lovely moduli space. Uh, when I don't view it as a stack and view it as a coarse moduli space, this is isomorphic to M0 in bar, okay? Um, but I want to do, I want to think of it stackily because I want to look at its universal curve and then the universal line bundle over it. 
And then I'm going to look at the Witten bundle, which is the first drive push forward of this. Uh, or you can think of the fiber as just H1 of, this line, of the, this line bundle L over each point. And then I'm going to take the Euler class of this Witten bundle and then integrate it over this. And when the rank of the Witten bundle is equal to the dimension, then I'm going to get a non-trivial invariant. Okay. So these are the closed enumerative invariants that I just get from looking at the, um, some type of integral over this moduli space. Now, what's the open analog of this thing, right? The open analog is thinking of disks. So I take a moduli space of orbit disks that are over this. So the way you should think of a disk um, is not like, is you should think of um, the interior to be like the upper half plane, and then this as the, the boundary is R with the point at infinity inside P1, okay? And then I'm going to take marked points that are inside here, and then also on the boundary, and I'll and then I can think of a rational curve as just taking the complex conjugation of this. So all the marked points on the interior go to the, uh, its complex conjugate. So in this picture, I have uh, these two interior marked points, and their complex conjugates will also be marked points. Okay? And then I will still have an orbital line bundle, as I previously did for the closed case, um, and then I have to kind of give the same type of twist, and so on and so forth. But I, and I end up with a moduli space of orbit disks, okay? And uh, in order for mirror symmetry to work, I need to require that all of the boundary marked points have twist R minus two, okay? Now, when I do this, I can, um, I, I make a, a moduli space, but I've only made a moduli spaces of like smooth orbit disks. I haven't done anything closing it, right? And this is kind of a fun thing where the way that it can compactify is you have a bunch of different types of nodes, okay? Um, so let me kind of give you an example that tells you kind of what happens here is, um, I'll look at the moduli space where you have um, two boundary marked points and one internal, or no, yeah, let's just do two internal marked points, yeah. So a priori, this is just going to look like this. And the double disk is going to look like, I have two up here and two down here, right? So it's something inside M04 bar. It's just a P1, right? But you know, I, I, I have a condition where they have to be complex conjugates of each other. So it, I end up with a real one-dimensional moduli space. And there's two ways that this can work. Well, I can fix one of these to be at I. And then using Mobius transformations, I can rotate this so that it's on the line between zero and I. So what can happen is this point can degenerate and go to zero. When it goes to zero, what's happening is this point's going to zero, but then this point is also going to zero. So they're colliding and I have to bubble. So I end up with two disks that look like this. So I have one of the internal mark points and one of the internal mark points in here. So that's kind of case B here. Now, and the other thing that can happen is this one moves over here, and then I have to bubble in the interior. So that looks like this, where I end up with these two. But the problem is, is that this double disk will only have two marked points in it, so it becomes unstable because I could just rotate. So what I do is I contract. So this is kind of the contracted boundary case C that you see. So doing this allows me to get a real manifold with corners as a moduli space. So what we can, and this is another example that's really kind of pretty, where you have, a, <laughs> like, you have three boundary mark points and one internal mark point, you get a hexagon, and each of these boundary strata are, these are the boundary strata, okay? All right, so we can just take the universal line bundle and the Witten bundle as we had before, but in order to make it a real bundle, we have to take the anti, uh, the, the part that's anti-invariant with respect to the complex conjugation, and then we can define the invariance. 
but there's a, there's a problem with here is that I'm doing something over a real manifold with corners, so I need to specify what's happening on the boundaries. So I do that by choosing some canonical uh, multi-section or section of the, of the bundle uh, that gives me prescribed kind of inductive structure. And when you do this, you get this theorem by Buryat, Clater, and Tesler that says that they exist and they don't depend on this choice that I made here. And they give the closed form that, I were able to, that we were able to use in this deformation to make this generating function. Okay. So to answer the question more refined of today is that you use these kind of invariants in order to get the mirror LG model and the deformation. So in particular, when I have no internal markings, that gives me the, it gives me the potential, and then when I have internal markings, it'll give me the deformation. So there's a nice kind of bifurcation of what you want to do here. So if you just want the mirror, then you can just only use the boundary markings, and you can have internal markings if you want the whole thing. All right, now let me tell you what happens in dimension two, because that's what I spent a lot of my life in the last eight years thinking about. Um, so, um, this is kind of the original theorem in uh, dimension one, but there's a lot that changes in dimension two. So first off, we built a new theory for mu r and mu s um, to make a new version of open and numerate variance just for this Fermat here. And this, a lot of things change. So first off, uh, they do depend on the choice of the family of sections that you put it on it, um, but it's actually okay, and all of those choices will give you flat co coordinates. So the flat coordinates stop being unique, and all of them work. Then you get something called topological recursion, but it's not for a single invariant anymore, which is, but it's given by polynomials and relations of these polynomials, which is, this is the first time I've seen some type of form of topological recursion that's for not just a single invariant. And it doesn't give me a closed form of solutions of invariance, but it gives me a primitive form in flat coordinates for the mirror, and there's a whole infinite set of choices, and we get a Lie group that acts transitively across all the choices, too, or freely and transitively. It's a really nice kind of beautiful object. All right. And it, it's kind of like the analog of like, it's like an LG version of like a symplectic Cremona group. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so the key features are that I have two line bundles instead of one. Uh, I, I end up with two different types of twists, and then um, the invariants depend on this, but we can construct homotopies between the choices, and then we can like control the, homo the number of zeros that go in and out of these real manifolds, or these real overfolds. Uh, but one thing that's really kind of cute about this is that you know, the, the, the one dimensional case is like A in singularities, right? And only in like the, in the Fermat case, like there's only two kind of polynomials we end up with. We have like the, the x to the r, or the, the, that, that you see in ADE world, which is like E6 and E8. And these are the only two new ones that are still unique. So we believe that open invariants are only unique for ADE singularity. So you kind of see this kind of classification continuing. Okay, I think I'm done. Yeah, I'm sorry I went over like a minute or two. <laughs>